Hello, and welcome to the Radiant Mission Podcast. My name is Rebecca Toomey, and I'm here today with my amazing co-host, Rachel Smith. Hey. <laughs> I never oh. know how to, like, say hi. <laughs> like, yeah, you're so awkward. What's with that? <laughs> I don't know. It's like talking to a microphone. I don't know how to... Like, hey, guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, hopefully we can get through this episode today since Rachel and I got on we've already been talking for 45 minutes and exactly <laughs> so now we've got some more chatting to do but we just want to say thank you for listening today we are on a mission to encourage you on this journey through life and as you grow in your relationship with Yahweh so thank you for being here today we are going to be continuing our conversation about spiritual warfare with a specific lens on the concepts of spiritual oppression and possession. Exciting. We'll talk a bit about Satan, AKA we talked about last time, he who shall not be named his little demons, his little minions, and what it means to be spiritually oppressed. So here we go, Ray. (laughs) Yeah. Last week, we deep dived into the Nephilim, which kicked off this conversation of how there are literal spirits roaming the earth, looking for bodies to inhabit. And most people are probably familiar with possession or being possessed, Mm -hmm. you know, because of movies like the exorcist, which I have not seen and will not see and things like that. But we're also told that once we become a Christian, that we can't be possessed by a demon. So this is what we want to dig into today. What's the difference between being possessed and being oppressed? By the way, it drives Mike crazy when I say that, because I'm always saying like, oh, oppressed, oppressed, <laughs> <laughs> oppressed. <laughs> um, oppressed. But I want to emphasize that it starts with an O because it kind of sounds like I'm saying uh, oppressed. Oh Oh, yeah. I see what you mean. Yeah. Oppressed is how it's spelled. And just (laughs) emphasizing the difference that you're not saying possessed because people like hear the word like really quick and they're like, oh, well that can't happen to a believer. And it's like, we're talking about different things here. So yeah. Yeah. So talk to me about that. I would love for you to kind of, because honestly, I didn't think much about this conversation until pretty recently when you and I had a great chat before I had little baby Ben about oppression. So talk to me about the difference between possession and oppression. (laughs) (laughs) So first of all, I want to say I am no like deliverance ministry expert here, (laughs) which is actually like a whole, I don't know if you want to call it a denomination of uh, Christianity, but it's a thing that people do. There's like prayer houses with, um, people who specialize, they're just prayer warriors to anoint people Mm -hmm. and cast out demons or oppression and stuff like that. I don't personally have experience with that, but I do know people and I have talked in quite detail with people who do have experience with that. Would you consider that to be the same thing as being an intercessor or do you see that as separate or no opinion. Uh, yeah, I, I probably say no, I I don't know really. Mm -hmm. It's, it's kind of, it's funny. Like, you know, we talk a lot about, well, not funny, haha, but you know, (laughs) you and I talk a lot about how, um, we were raised in a Christian home and the past few years, we've both just been like in this path of like awakening to so many things around the world, like, Mm -hmm. you know, that impacting us that we were never aware of our whole life. And so I feel like, even though I grew up in the church, there's so much spiritually I've been ignorant to. Hmm. That's where I, why I am disclaiming of like, I don't have some ministry background of like seeing this stuff. Oh, you don't have a PhD in, um, (laughs) in exorcism. (laughs) No, in ministry, but I do feel, yeah, exactly. (laughs) I do feel like the Lord has opened my eyes to the way that I have been oppressed and I, and he has given me understanding Mm -hmm. and, Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think in a way, like just to 
humbly say that this conversation we're having is as laymen, lay women. I don't know. If lay <laughs> women is, is, is we are just two women who love the Lord, whose eyes have recently been opening open to the spiritual realm. And we're, mm-hmm. you know, we've, the Lord has given us understanding. We've started to look at, you know, things that have happened to us in the past mm-hmm. with new eyes. Yeah. Um, it, it really does feel like sometimes like putting on these, instead of rose colored glasses, they're like, glasses to the spiritual realm, but like looking back in the past. So, mm-hmm. um, anyway, and in the present. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Because now I see things for what they are, mm-hmm. um, yeah. in, in like real time. So it really has impacted me in that way. So, um, the reason I wanted to lay the groundwork, the last episode on Genesis six and what demons actually are is to set a framework with what, when you and I are talking about these things of what we're both working with, when we discuss spiritual warfare, um, and, you know, kind of like I just mentioned and things backwards, like I, all of this started with understanding demonic oppression. And then I started researching in the Bible, spiritual warfare, and then like, what is a demon then? Like what is spiritually oppressing us? Mm -hmm. And so that's when I was researching, um, where this all started in Genesis. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in my knowledge worked backwards, Mm -hmm. but this, that's kind of setting the framework for things that you and I will be discussing a lot with all kinds of different topics, because this is kind of the, the groundwork of the battlefield that we're all working with. And, yeah. and this is, um, you know, Christ came to free us from our sin and sin plays a role in spiritual warfare. So this is one of the things he came to, to set us free from. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, you know, just why it's so significant to me. So, um, you know, kind of like we discussed last episode, uh, demons are disembodied spirits of the Nephilim and they're been wandering the earth for thousands of years, mm-hmm. looking for a body to torment, um, or to inhabit, to indulge the lusts of the flesh. Um, uh, simply put to answer your question about, so what exactly is oppression <laughs> is, um, uh, it's when a demon influences a person, influences. which would, is, yeah. And that would include a believer. Okay. Yes. Um, so I think I mentioned last time I, I, I'm a visual person. So I, I, and I have a really wild imagination. So I, I picture these things as, I mean, and I've experienced it. So like, I, 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 you know, I, I'm also talking from that mindset too, that they are not inside our body, like a possession, which a possession literally is controlling the whole body. The, this is why in the Bible, it shows someone who's possessed has the strength of like 20 men or something. And, um, mm-hmm. and you know, people it's completely this. overtaken their body. Exactly. It's, it, it's almost like, imagine it as a entity taking over your body and you're still in it too, but yeah. you're not in control anymore. Yeah. Where so, oppression. Yeah. Ahead oppression is whispering to us from the outside. Mm. And then we have the authority on, um, being in agreement with that demonic entity Mm -hmm. and they very much can influence us and they appeal, they still appeal, whether it's possession or oppression, they still appeal to the lusts of the flesh. So, um, if someone has, um, you know, like a struggle with alcoholism, or something very real, like physically wrong with them. Like I I mentioned last time, my experience with mental disorder, that is a very real chemical imbalance in my brain that a demon will and has, and I have experienced it used to, um, has used to oppress me that, that, that they know that's a weakness. And so that they will press Mm -hmm. on that weakness Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, so there, I, I think it's just so important 
um, for like as believers to be to be aware of these things and be thinking about these things because like you know I said this isn't something I realized before yeah. and people can be oppressed for their entire life and never realize it yeah you know we think it's us we think it's ourselves we think mm-hmm. these thoughts are coming from us we'll call them intrusive thoughts or whatever mm-hmm. but as a believer standing on the foundation of the word of God mm-hmm. is this is biblical. And I looked it up because um, I was wondering that it just in the New Testament, there are about 80 references to demons. Mm. <laughs> so There's a lot of them. Yeah. So it's like, if, if you're a believer, this is biblical and it, and it is happening and it hasn't stopped happening. No. In fact, I, I personally feel that the devil has used technology as a tool for his good in many Mm -hmm. ways. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually kind of have a joke that sometimes God will allow the algorithms to work for us in positive Mm -hmm. ways. You know, sometimes God sneaks through and, and he makes it work, but too many times I see the quote algorithm, or I see social media working to feed and fuel oppression in people Oh my gosh. because what yeah. happens on social media, we are faced against comparison is one of the biggest ones for women that we see comparing our bodies, comparing our lives, comparing our spouses, comparing our children, comparing everything. And then that creates in us this, I'm not enough. I don't have enough attitude that then opens those doorways for the, those quote demons to keep feeding into that, feed into yeah. that anxiety or those fears or the depression that is caused by literally what we're seeing in front of our eyes. Yeah, absolutely. I'm telling you, I am 100% sure that I have debated demons in comment sections on the internet. (laughs) I'm not surprised by that either. And and I even like had the thought, like, I don't know if there was really a person behind that screen or if this is literally like a demon inside the (laughs) metaverse or whatever we're calling it these days. Like there's one case in particular, this is years ago. I don't know why I ever used to respond to people's comments on (laughs) stuff. I don't, I don't do that anymore. Um, but, uh, this was, it was on a YouTube video that I was like, actually, I remember that's the worst, but I was going to say is this on YouTube <laughs> like because the scum of the earth in those comment <laughs> sections. Uh, but, uh, it was a Chuck Missler YouTube video and someone had responded in like all caps, like something really intense, like <laughs> negative about the video. And, and I like responded like in defense or whatever. And then we're going back and forth and I'm like, I don't think I'm talking to a real person right now. Mm. Yeah. It was, I can't remember all the specifics right now, but I just remember in the moment having the thought, I feel like I'm debating a demon Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and maybe I was (laughs) something that kind of crossed you. You could have been something that crosses over a little bit is we have been seeing a lot of former Christians that are Mm -hmm. quote deconstructing right now. And we've had this conversation about what's really going on because a lot of times it's actually the quote church, you know, the physical body of a church that they're attending and the people that are within those churches that are causing. Yeah. The organization. It's the organization that's causing these Christians to, yeah, to fall away. But it's also, in my opinion, from just kind of the outside looking in. I see that there must be some sort of oppression going on where they're being whispered lies. You know, they're being whispered Mm -hmm. things like, oh, you know, how could you, how could you go along with this when there's these terrible people? And that's something, you know, this is a conversation for another day, but we cannot put our faith in stock in an organization or in human beings, human beings. I mean, we're the worst possible example for Christ that there is. 
And when we start to look to other people as our example of Christ, that's when we're really, that's, we're really going to get eaten alive with oppressive thoughts, in my opinion. Absolutely. Yeah. It's people are conditioned from birth that you find God in a building Mm -hmm. through access through these organizations, whether it's a priest or a pastor or whatever, but that's not ever how, like, yes, there was a time where the spirit of the living God was literally in the temple, Mm -hmm. but that's not today. Now today the temple is our bodies and the spirit Mm -hmm. of the living God is inside of us. If we have invited him in. And Mm -hmm. so that actually Mm -hmm. is a good transition into why do people say that a believer cannot be demonically possessed? And I was thinking about that a lot this week. And I even like Googled it a few times (laughs) because I couldn't think off the top of my head, like a exact Bible verse that says anyone who has Christ can never be possessed by a demon. Like I couldn't think of that. So I looked through a lot of different scriptures and there isn't one that says it exactly. So it is kind of a, um, you know, deductive reasoning, I guess you should say from scriptures that, um, we do have in the new Testament. Uh, the, one of the ones that I like the best is Colossians 1 13 for he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And then, um, you know, I read a lot about which adds up for me too, is if you are filled with the Holy spirit, there is no room for another spirit to inhabit you. Like that's why we say that a believer cannot be possessed possess just it's more of an influence right at that point yes. it's not a it's not all cons- consuming right so you know a- it's kind of that difference of not being the not changing the behavior of the person's entire life not having it change their personality their attitude their manners it's the it's not taking over their physical body mm-hmm. when you have the spirit in you it's those whispers of exactly i'm not good enough of should you really do that or even you know sometimes oh you really think that god is going to do this for you it's kind of that negativity Mm -hmm. about the lord too you know yeah the the questions that that we'll get about our our own faith yeah absolutely did we talk about last time my jesus prayer i don't think so Yeah. I know you and I have talked about it before, but so this is the best personal example that I have for oppression is, um, many years ago, this was around the time where I, um, was coming back into my relationship with God, because, you know, like we've mentioned, even though we're raised Christians, um, I completely fell away and I had even though I always believed in him and I thought I would still be saved if I died, I had no relationship with him whatsoever. And I barely even ever thought about him. But then once I became a mother and um, the Holy Spirit just began working in me and um, I started reading the book of Revelation (laughs) first, and then I was baptized. And I honestly... I know without a doubt that is when I was indwelt with the Holy spirit. I I felt it. I saw, I mean, I didn't literally see it, but I experienced something. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that is when the Holy spirit came into me when I was baptized as a adult. And after that, um, it was like, I was on fire for the Lord Mm -hmm. and like things were happening so rapidly. And then I started having any idle time. I would start having these thoughts. Like, I remember it was a lot of times when I was driving, like, how do you know any of this is real? Like, how do you even know that God is real? Like, and I, I I would just, it would be like a barrage, like of thoughts of negative thoughts about my faith. Mm 
Mm-hmm. It almost felt it, like it was someone else. Exactly. It did. You. It did. It felt like it was someone saying these thoughts to me. Mm-hmm. And I remember w- w- after a few times of it happening. And one time when I was driving and I started to get so overwhelmed by it and I was getting upset because I, I was like, I couldn't make it stop or I didn't, it, it just felt like it wasn't my own thoughts. Mm-hmm. And the thought popped into my head in a second of this song lyric of a song. I don't even like that would play on <laughs> Caleb or something. Oh no. Was it Waymaker? <laughs> no, <laughs> it was so, it was one of those like rock songs, like with those Christian rock songs. Okay. Uh, but the lyric came into my, my mind, like lightning when you don't know what to say, just say Jesus. Mm. Okay. And so I, while I'm getting this barrage of thoughts, that thought came into my mind. And so I said out loud, Jesus, and in an instant, all of the, the thoughts stopped. They were gone. So much so I couldn't even remember what they were saying. And that to me, it was like the enemy showed me his hand. Mm. Like I have more than enough evidence for the existence of God in Mm -hmm. both the word of God and things I have experienced, but this it's like, they messed up. (laughs) <laughs> with me in that way, because then they revealed themselves to me in yeah. that, in that way. And that is the power and authority as a believer in Christ is that there is power in his name Absolutely. and they have to flee in his mm-hmm. name. What the word mm-hmm. says is true. They have to flee. And so I started calling that my Jesus prayer mm-hmm. is literally when you don't know what to say, just say Jesus. And I, I know this isn't like a novel concept, like anyone <laughs> who, who works in deliverance ministry knows this of, you know, rebuking demons in in the name of um, Jesus or Yeshua, you could use either um, language, but they know his name and his authority. And they have to leave us. Now, it doesn't mean that they never come back. Yeah, um, sure. Could come back five minutes later. Yeah, exactly. And it's it's kind of, it's interesting because that did used to happen to me. And that wasn't the last time it happened to me, but I would use my Jesus prayer. And ever mm-hmm. I'm telling you every time the thoughts disappeared. And um, I, I realized probably in the past year that those intrusive thoughts don't happen anymore. Those voices, they don't come for me in that way anymore. For in that way. And that's what I was going to say that challenging my faith. They don't, it's not just faith challenging that I would consider to be oppression. It's eating us in any ways that are negative. It's feeding into anxiety or feeding into stress or feeding into fears, um, jealousy, you know, yeah, that there's many ways that we could be oppressed and kind of like you talked about last time with, I love that visual of the strongholds that you, that you paint the picture of, you know, imagine that it's like a, like a, your soul's like a round thing with holes in it. And it's just sticking a little finger in there, you know, mm-hmm. sticking a claw in it. That visual for me is something easy to understand and digest. And so if we think about, let's say that there is turmoil in our marriage and there's trust that has been breached, you know, that's mm-hmm. a potential stronghold. And then you have those whispers like, oh, well, what if your husband is doing this? Or what if this is happening, you know, or what if whatever scenario. And then at the same time, you're also experiencing self-conscious issues. You don't think that you're good enough because you're on social media <laughs> and, and that again, um, uh, I shouldn't go there. I was going to go there with what Ali Stuckby says about us not being enough, but I won't go there. <laughs> that's too big. You're not a, enough and that's okay. Yeah. You're not enough and that's okay. But Jesus yeah. is. Yeah. So, but yeah. you know, the, the idea is there that there are a lot of different ways that we can be oppressed in t- at the same time, mm-hmm. basically. Yes. Oh yeah, absolutely. That's why I, <sighs> having my eyes open to just the whole spiritual world, it has made me realize that there's possibly like thousands of things messing with us at any Mm. given time. And the more that you're fighting for the kingdom of God, 
the more that they're, they're coming for you. Oh, and, for and, sure. And it's like the hard, yeah. Like we've been talking about this, you know, personally lately is mm-hmm. we have all kinds of issues and, and, and <laughs> we got problems. <laughs> yeah. But they, you know, it's like our health, our mental health, our, our children, that's a big, and, and like you said, marriage. Um, so learning how to pray against these things is, um, the biggest defense. Yes. And so I, I had, um, definitely I'm, I'm grateful for women that, um, I've followed on social media who would talk about, um, spiritual oppression a lot and, um, kind of introduced me to the concept of deliverance ministry where, I was able to, um, just learn a little bit more about like what they do and how they do things. Interestingly, a lot of people in that type of ministry used to be witches or Mm. warlocks. Mm. Um, so it's like, they know how to fight it because they were, they were, yes, because witches and, um, warlocks, they are partnering with demons mm-hmm. to oppress people. And, um, so once I was introduced to that, I really realized that there can be, so there's a concept of like, um, spiritual strongholds mm. and, and, and certain sins that we commit that while we are forgiven, when we put our faith in Christ and he washes us clean of that sin, there's a legal agreement that we made with a demon when we committed that sin Mm -hmm. that we need to cancel and figuratively tear up that Mm -hmm. legal document that's on our soul. So a big one is sexual sins. That's a big one. This is what, um, I did not, I wish I did, but I did not understand this when I was young, that the Bible saying that sex is between a man and a woman in marriage is about so much more than what the mainstream church or just society has, has made it about that there is a spiritual element to being physically intimate with someone. Mm-hmm. There's a tie and that exactly you are a binding. soul tie. You're exactly your soul tying binding with that other person. Exactly. Essentially forever. Yes. Unless and it's you not release a, that tie. Exactly. And it's not a matter of, I think that the kind of the purity culture that you and I came from mm-hmm. can be very damaging. Like there was something like, purity culture kind of uses that imagery of like, oh, you're giving away a piece of your flower, whatever. It's not the right picture. It's actually, like you said, a, a piece of your soul that is now binded to a piece of another person's soul. Mm -hmm. Now that can be broken. Yes. But there is a spiritual force behind that. And this is why I say the reason that the Lord does not want us to have multiple sexual partners is because of what it does to our soul and our spirit. And that that is between a, a husband and a wife that will procreate to literally make another soul. Mm -hmm. And when, and when that's done, that does damage to our soul, which we will feel physically like, you know, STDs, Mm -hmm. or we will feel mentally. And, and especially as women, I know all of us have been there of Mm -hmm. how emotionally broken we can be after, after, you know, an experience. And then, you know, with someone that doesn't actually love you or care about you. So I say all that to say there is a spiritual demonic attachment to that. There Mm -hmm. is another force there involved when we commit that type of sin. And I realized, um, um, after studying 
um, these uh, spiritual warfare prayers and that the soul ties that we can have, because it's not always sexual. It can, it can be other things. Um, and, and it can even be things like from our family. Like, let's say someone had a grandmother who was a witch or something um, that can be a soul tie as well. Um, I, I realized that. And um, I went through a specific deliverance prayer um, on my, on my own, because I, I, there was just things that the Lord had revealed to me that I had a demonic spirit attached to me from sexual sins of my past. And that I needed to break that, that tie. And so I said these prayers out loud and, you know, told it that my foundation is, you know, in Christ and I am covered by the blood Mm -hmm. and that, you know, in his authority that has to leave. And, um, I'm not going to say like, I like saw some crazy thing. I didn't, but I felt, I felt definitely lighter afterwards. And it's something I have never, I've never felt condemnation about again, because that's the thing is if we don't break those ties, like I said, we are forgiven in Christ. He has forgiven us, but though that enemy is still going to come for us in condemnation. Yeah. So break off and that they have no more authority and they have to leave. And in, in my experience, um, yeah, that happened. That's awesome. First of all, I want to refer back to the book that we've been talking about a little bit, a woman's guide to spiritual warfare. That's still sitting on my desk here. There was a section in that book about this specific topic. So if anybody is looking for kind of a little bit more detail on this and prayers on how to release or unbind that book did have some resources in it that might be helpful. Yeah. Um, cause it's true. You know, we, we attach ourselves to other people in that way. And actually she gave examples about how to know if you are still bound to that other person. And one of them is if you are constantly thinking about that experience or experiences you had, or that person, you're still, you still have a soul tie with them and mm. you need to release that soul tie. And I thought that was interesting. You know, I, I think that there could even be something to be said about your significant other or your husband still having a soul tie with someone too. Mm -hmm. If you feel obsessively about someone that they were with, there's a chance it's because there's still a soul tie associated Mm -hmm. with your partner. Yeah. That needs to be broken. So this is definitely a conversation to have with our spouses, you know, have this open conversation about it and just talk about it. I'm sure they may think that this is a little wacky at first because many men don't, I don't want, this isn't emotionalized isn't a word, but you know, many men may not think of sex as emotionally as women. Also, we have been programmed by society that sex is meaningless and normal. We have, but at the end of the day, we know that that's not true. Even if we could be told that lie all day long and it's eventually going to catch up. Yeah. It always does. You know, Yeah. even people that I have known for a long time that are casual type of people about it, it, it catches up eventually because you, you become soul tied. And when you do have that tie, and you finally fully recognize it, you know, it's too late at that point it's happened. Right. And then now you have to move on from there, but it can happen. And I want to kind of refer back to what you were saying about prayer. You actually recommended this book to me and you still haven't read it (laughs) because you gave your copy away. I gave my copy away before I could read it, but I could tell it was good. (laughs) It's called prayers that shake heaven and earth. This font is huge, but I actually kind of I like it because I can read it in the dark when I'm <laughs> nursing the baby. It's the old lady status. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm kind of into it. Um, from page one, I sent you a picture of the first page of yeah. prayers. I knew it was going to be good because 
he focuses on some pretty deep stuff. Some people that have been basically mind the, controlled. Read the cover again. Prayers that shake heaven and earth by Daniel Duval. So I'll put a link in my, in the show notes too. Yeah. He's got all kinds of prayers in here. Had to be, oh my gosh, his description of Christ's death. I was shook and I've been a Christian for 35 years, well, not 35 years, not since birth, but you know, for a long time <laughs> and have seen the passion of the Christ and have read this story and his description of Jesus during his death was horrible. I mean, it was beautifully written, but it was horrible. It was like, I don't know how anyone could read it and not feel something and not feel like, wow, I can't believe what he went through for us. What he, it, it, you it's know, what crazy. I, I think of is how expensive our sin is Yeah, of what it cost for real. It, it, it was no one today could go through. I mean, I, I couldn't imagine someone having to physically go through what he went through physically. I mean, I won't get into the gruesome details. I'll let you guys check it out if you're interested, but there are prayers for the morning, prayers for the evening, prayers for our children, healing, financial power, travel, pets, technology, leaders, all kinds of stuff. Um, but one of the things that I can I was going to say my next sentence, but I, I haven't gotten to this one yet. Freedom from Illuminati bloodlines and genetics. <laughs> oh, freedom from fallen angel bloodlines and genetics. I can't yeah. wait to get to those. Um, but what I wanted to point out in this book was I learned about angels in a different way. I never thought about it the way that he put them into these prayers. Now he says at the beginning of this book, this book is not a teaching tool. They're just prayers but there's going to be things that you read that you probably haven't read before. And so go research it. And that was something that stood out to me is he taught, and he sometimes does have footnotes and will explain some things was angels was something he referred to a lot where he said, you know, if there's this demonic world where we're being oppressed by demons that are trying to communicate with us, you have to remember that there's also the opposite. There are also angels that are fighting in the war for us. And so in some of his prayers, he has not only rebuke the devil, rebuke demons, not only ask for deliverance, but also ask for a hedge of protections. Lord also bring your angels to come above and below my house and outside my door and protect me from these entities Mm-hmm. bring these angels over here. Come on, let's, let's, uh, let's fight together. You know, we don't have to do it alone. And I thought that was really significant and something I hadn't thought about adding to a prayer like that. Yeah. And that, that is biblical that he does send his angels to protect us. And, um, and then also the hedge of protection is a reference to, to Job mm-hmm. that when the accuser came accusing and God said that Job is righteous and Satan said, well, that's just because your hedge of protection is around him. Like, <laughs> what if he didn't have that? Yeah. Um, I mean, this is obviously the Rachel translation, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, that I, I, I think that this is probably a, uh, appropriate time in the conversation to mention, um, like anointing our homes. Um, he did talk about that too. Yeah. Anointing. And, and yeah, that, that, um, demonic oppression or spiritual warfare. It's not always just something that follows us, the person, but they can stay in certain locations. And that can especially be tied to if, um, you know, some sin has been committed on that land. Mm-hmm. Like I heard a lot of people talking about, um, you know, like shed blood. It's like mm-hmm. the greatest sin that there is, mm. um, that a human, you know, could commit. So if that has been, 
blood sacrifice, anything like that on a land that there is a certain um, spiritual tie, like a corruption in that land. And so that it could be a hot spot for demons and things mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. Or, um, you know, not to get like too blurry, if you will, <laughs> but like if someone has died somewhere mm-hmm. now, I'm not getting into the realm of like a ghost or anything like that, but there is some kind of demonic or like demons like to mimic uh, humans and they like to deceive and, and just prey on people. And so I say that to say, um, the house that I'm living in now, like when we first moved in here, we didn't feel right. It was weird. Like we were excited about, I've actually never experienced this particular feeling when I've moved into anywhere before, um, this house was built in the seventies. So like, you know, it has had a long history of people living here and, you know, nobody, you never know what in the place that you're living. Um, and it was something with both my husband, Chris and I, we just felt off spiritually. We felt like we were on edge. Um, I kept waking up in the middle of the night, just like sitting up in bed, like my heart racing and, and just feeling like anxious. And then the real icing on the cake, this happened to him twice. I think it was two times. He was awakened from sleep by somebody right in front of his face, whispering dad. And like, he like even woke me up one time because he's like, Oh, the boys are out of bed and like goes and checks on them and they're sleeping. And it Mm -hmm. happened to him twice. And at that point, because while Chris loves the Lord and he's a man of God, he, this spiritual stuff can be weird for a lot of people because they don't necessarily see it. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I, and I know because that's how I was when I first started like opening my eyes to it and and understanding more until he experienced this. I don't think he really got it that much. And then he was like, we need to anoint this house. And (laughs) and what was so interesting is that just the series of events had like let up, like we weren't even completely um, unpacked, but a, a friend of mine from a Bible study had given me a book about anointing homes because she knew I was moving. I hadn't read it or I had started reading it. And immediately I was like, Chris needs to read this because it was very clear. This needs to be the spiritual leader of the house to do this. So this isn't for me, this is for him. And I put it on his nightstand and just in the shuffle of moving in, I had a bottle of anointing oil from Israel that someone had given me over a year before (laughs) I'd never used it, never took it out of the box. It was just like, you know, when you move into a house, everything explodes and is everywhere. Chris is like, I need to read this book and we need to anoint our home. Literally the book and the anointing oil just happened to be sitting on his nightstand next mm. to his bed. I didn't do that intentionally. Yeah. And, um, and so he read it and we anointed our home actually, ironically on Halloween. We didn't <laughs> plan that. <laughs> we didn't plan that. What a he day to do me, it. He told me, I, I want us to anoint our home today. And we went around the four corners of our property and all of the doorways into and in the house. And, and we had some friends join us on that and it, it was great. And we have never had that feeling in this house again. Wow. That just feeling of anxiousness. So, um, I don't want us to necessarily go off on a tangent about Halloween, but <laughs> I will say this in passing that if you are listening and you have felt weird about Halloween, and you felt like maybe there's something not right about it, pray on it because Mm, it's probably, that's probably something that the Lord is trying to lead you away from because it is a very spiritual realm, not of the Lord rich day. And there's a lot even by spiritually even by just having fun with our kids or whatever, if it's in the quote spirit of Halloween, we are participating in, in in that. So just side tangent again, probably not 
somewhere that we want to go, but with it fastly approaching, it's something to something to think about. Yeah. Um, I do want to also mention this book again, has a prayer for room by room prayers and for praying over your whole house. What is the book called Rachel for anointing? Do you remember the name of it? Oh, when you remember it, add it to our yeah, notes. I'll we'll put add it, it in to the, the show notes. notes. I know I can't, it's something about anointing your doorways. Um, I gotta go dig it out of my bookshelf. Okay. And, um, I actually wasn't even planning on sharing that story. So that's why I don't <laughs> well, have, it, some folks might find it helpful and yeah, you actually encouraged me to do some anointing. We'll talk about that mm-hmm. probably next week. And anyway, I hope that this conversation has been helpful and that, you know, you've learned something by listening to it. We want to thank you as always for being on this journey with us. We hope that you feel encouraged and that you're leaving this wanting to dig into it more too. You know, again, we're always learning. Rachel and I are both on our individual journeys and we talk about a lot of this stuff together, but you know, we just want you to know that we're, we're here alongside you and we're learning too. And if you want to follow along outside the podcast, again, check it out. Instagram, we post some stuff at the radiant mission. If you want to share thoughts, the radiant mission at gmail.com. And if you want to watch in video format, go to YouTube. You can search finding by my name, Rebecca Toomey, T-W-O-M-E-Y. I need to start coming up with a jingle like Blippy. <laughs> <laughs> T W O M E Y. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and also, if you're enjoying this show, please throw us a five star rating or leave a review and let us know that you're enjoying it. That would mean so much to us. And I'd like to close us with the uh, verse, the second part of Thessalonians 3 3. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. But the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. I don't know if I Amen. M- messed up those verses. My punctuation is off. Yeah. <laughs> it sounded good. <laughs> <laughs> but we would like to thank you again. And we'd like to wish you a radiant week. We'll see yeah, you on the guys. next one. <laughs>